You know, we, we talk about dredging, but it's mining. When you said prospecting, yeah, it is a form of mining. It's yeah. They're yeah. basically mining, mining yeah, the river. They're mining the sand and gravel out of the river for commercial purposes. It's not for the public. I mean, we're not really getting a yeah. benefit out of it. Yeah, it's not the flood dredging. It's, no, no, and it's no. not maintaining right. the navigation channel. Not maintaining channel. the navigation it's channel. It's for the value for of that sand and gravel. Which they'll say, well, you know, we build roads with it. Well, that's fine, but you're not paying the true cost of the material that comes from the river versus, say, a quarry on the mainland. Which, by the way, the quarries on the mainland in the floodplain have the same quality of sand and gravel. The federal government built blocks and dams and allows them basically to get to places on the river that they couldn't get to if it were free flowing. Uh -huh. They don't pay, except for the fuel cost, to, to, to get the free transportation. And guess what? When they mine it from the river, the river washes it for them on the way out. So they don't have to wash the material. Uh, okay. You know, they bring it to the mainland, they sort it, and they truck it off and sell it. When you take that sand and gravel out, we've permanently lost it. We don't have um, the river replenishing the sand and gravel back, you know, 12, 10, 12,000 years ago when the glaciers melted and the outwash That's from the glaciers. That's where it came from. Um, you know, there's no more of it, and we're permanently removing valuable wildlife habitat that's in the river beneficial to fish to mussels fish, it's gone for good snails. and we don't we don't figure that cost into um, the, the value of the sand and gravel versus the value of wildlife habitat you see water yeah you don't know what's going on underwater you can't see what the natural substrate should look like uh, you know nine to fifteen feet of, of water over gravel and cobble and sand you can't see that mm -hmm. If you could see what it looks like there and then what it looks like in 35 to 45 feet of water, dark, silty, logs, trees, debris, it's nasty. And you know, when you look at this river over the last um, 100 years or so, I guess, you know, we've, we've viewed it mostly from its uh, economic value to us and we've kind of removed the idea that the river, river contributes to fish and wildlife. Then the refuge presence here is kind of, you know, reintroduced the the concept that, that we do value fish and wildlife and that the river has a lot of uses, one of which is um, the benefits to our natural uh, wildlife uh, heritage. And we've seen some really good things on this river in the last 15 year, 50 years or so. It's a lot cleaner than it was uh, with the passage of the Clean Water Act and you know some other regulations. Water quality is much better. We've seen wildlife return to the river. Mussels have um, returned. We've as long as they about, have habitat listed. We're hearing about bald eagles nesting nearby. You know, so And people are coming back to the river using it more for recreation. But uh, we, we want to make sure that we don't forget wildlife and their habitats in the equation of the f river's future. We, we have some mussels that we had planted back there in 2004 and again in 2006. Okay. And we're checking up on them to see how they're doing. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the objectives of our visit here this week. River mussels are a great example of, of animals that are filter feeders. Uh, they sit on the bottom of the river and they're constantly sucking Whoa. water through their bodies taking out silts and particles and pollutants and actually cleaning up the water. If I took four or five mussels and put them in a tank of, of dirty water, within an hour to two hours, the water would be clear. The more mussels you have in the river, the cleaner the water is because they actively clean it. That's one of our, the native mussels that got here on his own. Yeah, that's a, that's his, uh, and that's a little one. Little one, so we've got some fairly recent uh, hole to see, look, about one, one, you say two, three, four? Three, four, about a four-year-old maple leaf. We have a tagged, uh, a tagged mussel. This is a mucket uh, from the Allegheny Bridge Project. See the zebras? Oh, there are some zebra mussels. Pretty. To show you what they would look like in the bottom, this is all you would see just that much of the mussel sticking up. The rest of him is embedded in the end of the substrate. And of course, what the zebras can attach to is what sticks out. So you can see there are some zebra mussels encrusting uh, the native, not to the point where it's making it difficult to, to get food and oxygen yet, but 
in some situations they can they can encrust them so much that they cannot uh, they cannot get nutrition or oxygen and they do die. We got an osprey coming right oh, by. Oh yeah, here. an osprey. Which had they had, that bird had disappeared from the river for a period of 50 to 80 years, and now they're back because the water quality is better. The fish are back. They have something to feed on, and uh, that's a that's a success story. So when when this island erodes, we're losing refuge uh, acreage, acreage and. There's a lot of value to the underwater portion of the island, and we were discussing, you know, the fact that the dredging has removed acres of the island that had that were underwater prior to the construction of the dam. A lot of this area around the islands would have been above water during the, the low water summer months. So it's permanent removal of an island when the dredging occurs so close to the island. We really have to be sensitive to the, um, uh, the cultural resources that might be on an island. And because these are in the Ohio River, it, uh, it's pretty well certain that, you know, even before we looked at the, the islands, that they've all been used, you know, for thousands of years by Native Americans. And this island in particular had indications of use um, 12,000 years ago, which is really, um, kind of early in our, our human history. It's just, it just makes me ill, though, when I see um, what's happened to the island. And we, we can see it graphically with our boundary signs. As we've put in boundary signs and then um, come back a few years later, and then the boundary sign has eroded to where around the ground has eroded around it, and we find the sign you know, laying over on the, on the beach. It's like, well, there's that part of the island no longer there. See how different it is over here? The banks aren't visible through the vegetation. This is because we don't have commercial navigation. And the commercial navigation, uh, and, and we haven't had the dredging either, but this is typical of all the islands. The back channel, which we are in now, that we call the back channel, the area away from commercial navigation, doesn't have the wave action that erodes. And that wave action is particularly destructive when we have high water and, and the barges are moving through. Because, you know, you can just, as the water goes up, then the waves hit a higher point on the land. So they're, they're eating away at the islands. This is a result of the, the dams having, uh, the, they've opened gates where the debris has collected and we've got all this junk in the water. Something that we would like to see is before the debris, the woody debris is one thing, but all the plastics that collect, if there could be a way of not allowing that to just continue on down the river. It just